Good afternoon and welcome to this, the April 24th edition of Office Hours presented by the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness. My name is Dr. Tisa Silver Kennedy. I'm the founder and executive director of the center, and I thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, before I get into the questions that have come from our community, I just want to tell you a bit about the center, give you a few updates about what's happening in Maryland, and then we'll go straight to those questions. So if you're not familiar with the center, we were founded in 2021 with a vision for all college and career school students in the state of Maryland, and that's that they should be able to achieve these six pillars of collegiate financial wellness. Those are being credit worthy, ready, resilient, empowered, successful, and thriving. If this sounds like a vision that you want to get behind, I encourage you to visit us online at mccfw.org and find different ways you'd like to support. Um, also, we're on social media at the MCCFW on Facebook, Instagram, uh, X, the site formerly known as Twitter, as well as YouTube. And YouTube is where we place these office hours videos after they've been annotated. And before I get into the questions from our community, I just want to say that we do our very best to give you the most up-to-date and accurate information that we can find. Yet still, this is presented for informational purposes only. The information that's presented today does not constitute personal, legal, or financial advice. We get a lot of questions that provide us with snippets of a borrower's um, true household situation or a student's true household situation. And we answer the questions to the best of our abilities based on the information that was posed to us in the question. But everyone is different. Everyone has a different set of loans, different household circumstances, and all of those circumstances should be considered, along with information that you get from reliable sources, such as the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness, before you actually make any strategic decisions about your repayment journey. Um, before we get to the questions, one last thing I have to do, and that's just to give you a quick update on what's happening here in Maryland. So we still have plenty of public service loan forgiveness victories that are coming through. And um, I think we're at about 16 and a half million right now. So lots of victory, victories coming through. I want to say congratulations to every one of those public servants who worked for PSLF and now PSLF has finally worked for them. Another victory that I'm happy to report has to do with legislation, and that is HB 0811. HB 811 was a bill that was proposed um, by Delegate Sarah Wallach in um, Maryland's House of Delegates, and that was to create a financial well-being pilot program at the University of Maryland College Park and uh, Morgan State University. So both of those campuses are going to receive financial well-being coaches, and that will um, begin being offered later this year. The bill passed the House. It also passed the Senate. And by the time many of you watch this video, uh, the bill will have been signed into law by our governor here in Maryland. That's Governor Wes Moore. So I'm very excited about that bill, excited to see what's going to happen in the space of financial well-being on those two campuses, College Park and um, Morgan State University. I also wanted to share that we are very, very close to that April 30th deadline for the income driven repayment adjustment. We've been talking about it for months. Um, it's called the IDR adjustment and April 30th is the last date that borrowers who have those commercially held um, student loans, they're federal loans, but they're held by commercial banks. April 30th is the last day that people with those types of loans can complete the application to consolidate and get the most credit for the repayment history attached to those loans that were um, previously ineligible for benefits. So if you go to studentaid.gov, get to the dashboard, click view details, and then scroll down to your loan types, you want to look at the name of every single loan. And if you see a loan there that does not have the word direct in it, then that loan uh, would not qualify for public service loan forgiveness. Some of the direct loans can qualify, <coughs> excuse me, some of the non-direct loans can qualify for the IDR adjustment, but it's those commercially held loans that do not qualify. So take a look at your loan types. Another um, giveaway is looking at your servicer. When you look at the servicer name inside of studentaid.gov, if it says Department of Ed in front of it, that lets you know that your loans will be included in the IDR adjustment. If your servicer does not have Department of Ed in front of it and it says um, like one of the bank names, 
then that means the loans are commercially held and you would be one of the people who needs to apply to consolidate through studentaid.gov by April 30th so that you can get those loans switched over to the direct loan program and in the pipeline to be counted through the IDR adjustment. So um, we've had a big push um, this week. Uh, my team has helped many people get rid of those commercially held loans and get them on track to benefit from the IDR adjustment and PSOF. But as many people as we reach, we know that there are more people who are still going to be left out of this. So please go to studentaid.gov, take a look at your loans, see if they're direct, take it a step further, look at your servicers. And if you have those commercially held loans, please do consider taking action by consolidating um, completing that application to consolidate online at studentaid.gov by April 30th. All right. Well, hadn't planned to get into that much detail <laughs> uh, about the steps to make sure you're on track to benefit from the IDR adjustment, but that April 30th deadline is really close. It's six days away. So um, just really want as many people as possible to take advantage of the benefits um, of the IDR adjustment. All right. So let's get into our first question for the day. That question is, what is direct cost? Why is it broken down on my offer letter? So um, you'll notice that the questions that we've been receiving in recent weeks are more um, centered around current students in financial aid. Office hours is about student loans, but student loans are a form of financial aid. And so we're taking questions from people who are um, selecting a school or in school and returning to school and wondering what's going on with their financial aid and how to make a um, more informed decision about which school is most affordable for them. And the offer letter is a large component of making that decision. So let's talk about that. So when it comes to financial aid offer letters, there are gonna be several things that are included in there. Um, the offer letter usually includes something called the cost of attendance. The cost of attendance is each school's estimate of how much it would cost the student to attend for one year. So when you're looking at the cost of attendance, first it's important to know this is not the overall cost for a two-year degree or a four-year degree. This is for one year. This is the school's estimate of how much it will cost the student to be there. The cost of attendance has several factors included. It includes um, your enrollment. So of course the cost would be cheaper if you were part-time versus full-time. If you're going to a public school, you'll see a difference in the cost of attendance for in-state students or in-district students versus out-of-state or out-of-district students. Your housing is also included in the cost of attendance and that cost will be higher perhaps if you're living on campus versus staying at home with your family. So the cost of attendance has a lot of factors that go into it. But I want to um, highlight two types of costs that are included in there because some of the, those costs you have not much control over and others you can control. And our goal is to help people um, maximize their success and minimize debt. So it's very important that you pay attention to the details with the cost of attendance. So the cost of attendance includes two types of costs, direct costs and indirect costs. The direct costs are items that you are going to see when you receive a semester bill from the school. You can also find that information online. But direct costs include items such as your tuition, any fees, um, the cost of on-campus housing, as well as meal plans. So these are going to be billed to you by the school. The school controls these costs and they're billing you for those costs. These are the costs that sometimes I say you really can't get around these. <laughs> If you're a student, then these are the charges that you will see on your bill. Um, housing, perhaps not if you stay off campus, but tuition fees, those are costs that um, you don't set the rates for those. The school does and they will bill you accordingly. Indirect costs, on the other hand, are outside of the items that are billed to you directly by the school. These are costs that you will incur while you're pursuing higher education, but again, they're not billable to the school. So um, if you're in school, beyond tuition and fees, you will need to purchase books, perhaps, um, equipment, depending on what your major is. Um, if you have a car, you might have to pay for parking. Um, if you're taking transportation, you'd have to pay for that. If you're living off campus, you have to pay for that as well. Um, plus any meals that you eat that are not a part of a campus-based meal plan. So indirect costs are items that you are not going to see on your bill, but these are still costs that you have to incur as a result 
of pursuing higher education. So when you look at the cost of attendance, the figure might look large to you, but that's because it includes estimates for direct costs as well as estimates for indirect costs. And all of that together is the cost of attendance. Now, the schools are provided or required to provide the cost of attendance. So if you go to a school's website, um, you will see that there is a, a cost of attendance. It's usually under the financial aid um, portion of the website. But that cost of attendance, again, is an estimate of how much it would cost you, the student, to be at that institution attending for one year. The net cost is going to help you arrive at what your contribution um, will be beyond gift aid. So when you're thinking about net costs, you would start with that cost of attendance and then you would subtract scholarships and grants because that's gift aid, aid that does not have to be repaid. The difference between the gift aid and that cost of attendance is what you are responsible for. And you've got to figure out how much that is and how you're going to pay for it. After you receive a bill from the school, then you know exactly what the balance is that you're responsible for covering. And then you have to figure out how you're going to pay it. Um, this is where I want to make sure that people are clear that financial aid offer letters also include loans. So when you receive a financial aid offer from a school, and let's say the number um, available made available to you is $15,000, that $15,000 could come from scholarships, grants, or loans, or a combination of all three. It's just important to remember that just because something says financial aid doesn't mean that it's free or gift aid. So when you look at your financial aid offer letter, make sure that you're taking a look at the details of those components to see um, how much is gift aid, how much of it is loans, because the loans have to be repaid. Also, you might have cash that you would contribute out of pocket. Um, perhaps your family is saved for you, you've saved for yourself, or you're going to work and, and um, you know, pay a portion as you go. But really, the clarity comes when you have an accurate cost of attendance, and then you can see the semester bill. Now, if you have not um, made a decision about where you're enrolling yet, you haven't seen a bill, but you can estimate the components of a bill by looking at the tuition and fees, the housing charges and the meal plan charges. All of those should be listed online at the school's website. It's really important though to scrutinize that financial aid offer letter to determine how much is gift aid, how much is coming from loans, and then look at those actual direct charges, estimate your indirect costs, and figure out what's that gap and how are you going to pay it? All right, that was a great question. Uh, let's move on to the next question, which is, my parent does not have a social security number. Can I still complete the FAFSA? And the answer is yes, you can still complete the FAFSA even if your parent does not have um, a social security number. So there have been some changes uh, between the last year and the 24-25 um, academic year. The new process for creating a federal student aid ID does include a secondary identity verification process. So if you don't have a social, you can answer these knowledge-based questions through a partnership the Department of Education has with TransUnion, which is one of the credit reporting bureaus. If you're unable to complete that process, you will be required to complete another process to verify your identity. I know that this can get um, pretty complicated and sometimes daunting, but I do want to encourage all students who are eligible for federal student aid to complete the FAFSA because the FAFSA is the gateway to federal funding, but it's often also the gateway to scholarships and grants from your state of residence as well as scholarships or grants that might be offered by your school. So please, um, to students, complete the FAFSA. Parents, please give your student a fighting chance. I'm quoting our latest podcast guest, Jen Volberding from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County's Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships. The FAFSA truly gives your student an opportunity to, to get the funding that they're going to need to pay for such um, a high cost endeavor is higher education. So please, if you do not have a social security number, I mean, you're a parent, uh, try your best to complete this process. 
and verify your identity so that your student can have access to federal student aid as well as aid from the state and aid from their institution. There's several steps that you would have to take. Um, you have to enter some personal information, create an account, enter contact information, um, establish your communication preferences, answer some challenge questions, confirm, verify, and then go through two-step verification to complete the identity, identity verification. This process um, probably looks familiar to a lot of student loan borrowers who are, um, who are tuning in today because every time you log into studentaid.gov, you're asked to complete you know, a two-step verification. You're asked to verify your contact information. So um, this is not beyond what other people are experiencing. So please do um, try to create an FSA ID so that as a parent, you can give your student the opportunity to access federal student aid, aid from the state, as well as aid from their institution, because those applications often rely on information that is put into the FAFSA. All right, let's move on to our next question. I'm an athlete and my coaches have sent me scholarships through a portal. How do I decide which school is affordable for me? This is a great question um, that is a valid question for student athletes and other students. Um, affordability is, uh, it's important. It's also a loaded question because everybody is coming from a different circumstance. So what's affordable for one student might not be affordable for another. And this is where having all of the relevant information is really so important. So I would like for this student, if you have not received a financial aid offer letter yet, it sounds like you haven't, but you want to review that financial aid offer letter um, very, just pay attention to details. How much is being offered to you by the school overall? Within what's offered, how much of it is scholarship aid, grants, and how much of it comes from loans? Um, you may also be eligible for federal work study, which is a program where you work usually on campus or near campus and you earn money as you're working like a regular job. You would get a paycheck, but it's offered to you through financial aid. So take a look at that overall size of the offer letter, but then examine the components one by one. And what you want to do with that offer letter is compare that overall amount to the cost of attendance, because that will let you know if the school has provided you with enough financial aid or if they're offering you enough financial aid to cover that total cost. When you're making this decision, also be mindful of the fact that the cost of attendance that you see online with the school is probably going to be different. Um, it's going to differ from your actual cost of attendance. Perhaps you don't need um, as much money for parking and transportation, or you're living at home instead of on campus or off campus. There are those indirect costs there that you have the power um, to a certain degree to control. And if your indirect costs are lower, then your cost of attendance will be lower. But at the core of this decision is having an accurate picture of how much it's going to cost you and also accurate information about the sources of financial aid that you're eligible to receive. In terms of deciding what's affordable, it really comes down to the gap. What's the difference between the overall amount of financial aid that a school is giving you and the cost of attendance for you to be at that school? And within um, that gap, how much of that is going to be covered by loans? because you might receive an offer from one school that's 100% loans and still has a gap for you to cover, which means that you would have to get additional debt from private loans or have a parent take out a parent plus loan for you. So if a package is all loans, that's not looking affordable. If you have another school that's giving you scholarships and grants and some loans, it could be more attractive depending on the size of that gap. So you really need a financial aid offer letter from each school, as well as an accurate reflection of the cost of attendance. So you can determine what that gap is and um, really realistically look at whether that gap is something that you can cover. All right, let's move on to the next question. That is, my recertification date has changed. I was set to recertify in September of 2024, but now it's showing August of 2025. 
Did Mohila make a mistake? Because August, 25, August of 2025 will mark my 121st payment. So this question has to do with public service loan forgiveness. And before we get into the details, I do want to say that uh, we are, we've been made aware of several borrowers receiving requests for IDR recertification earlier than usual and earlier than they're required to. Um, for everyone who's received that and responded with the information, um, they did come back to tell us that they received a follow-up notice that said something to the effect of you're not required to do this yet. So perhaps there was a mix-up. I'm not sure, but um, your IDR recertification date um, regarding that deadline, Federal Student Aid has extended that deadline to November 1st of this year, and it's April now. So that means you've still got several months to recertify. The earliest requirement to update your income and family size has been set for September of 2024. Um, in this particular situation, I would advise the borrower to contact Mohila for clarity because Mohila is their servicer. Um, if they were sent the notification that they needed to recertify early, then it's likely to have come from Mohila. So I would contact them um, just to ask if this is correct or perhaps if it was sent to you in error because we know that the deadline has been extended but um, if you receive something like this requesting an early recertification you're not alone in that and we also have this timeline pulled from federal student aid about the recertification process for idr so three months prior to your recertification anniversary your servicer should reach out to you about recertifying your idr plan 35 days before that your income information is due. If you miss the deadline, your next billing statement might not reflect the information uh, that you provide. 10 days before is the absolute last day that you're supposed to be able to turn in those income documents. Um, but I'd encourage you to please stay on top of this because you don't want to have any disruption to your repayment experience. And you also want to make sure that you stay on track for public service loan forgiveness. If for some reason you left the income driven repayment plans, one of them, and you ended up on one of the traditional plans, on one of the fixed plans, time in those fixed plans under the regular rules of PSLF will not count toward the 120 payments you need to secure that PSLF approval. So you want to make sure that you stay on top of the recertification process. Also, um, inside of studentaid.gov, when you are applying for income driven repayment, you can opt in to have this process completed automatically every year. Some people aren't comfortable with that, but it definitely would um, do away with the issue of not recertifying in time and having a disruption to your income driven repayment plan. All right, let's move on to the next question. It is, should I submit my income information and recertify in case there's an issue? and then I need to make more payments or just go into forbearance while they evaluate the forgiveness. So this question is related to public service loan forgiveness. Um, just a bit of background on this borrower before the question is answered. The borrower is scheduled to make their final qualifying payment on December 4th of 2024. That's wonderful. Their IDR renewal date is just a few days later. It's scheduled for December 7th, 2024. And Mohila has already verified that this borrower has 111 payments that are eligible. I think um, I think what this borrower meant to say is that 111 payments are qualifying because if they're 111 qualifying, that means that they need nine more to get to that 120 milestone. And there's a difference between eligible payments and qualifying payments. So in this situation, um, since the borrower's last payment is supposed to be made right before the IDR recertification date. Um, the IDR recertification isn't necessary, but I am one to just make sure that things are smooth. <laughs> so I would actually recommend that this borrower seriously consider recertifying while they're waiting for PSLF approval, just because um, if there is some kind of unusual disruption, you know, and they needed perhaps one more payment than they originally thought, 
I would want that payment to still be on an income driven repayment plan so that it would count to get them to the 120. I don't foresee something like that happening. But again, I'm just one who likes to make sure that things are as smooth as possible. Um, I'd also instruct this borrower to make sure that they submit PSLF applications to recover all of their remaining eligible periods. So when you look at your payment count, you'll see eligible periods and you'll see uh, qualifying periods. They're listed as payments, eligible payments, qualifying payments. If a payment period is eligible, that means that it could convert to a qualifying payment if you had qualifying employment during that time and you certify it by completing a PSLF application and having that form verified. But remember, with the PSLF applications, they're only verified up to the date that your employer signed your last application. So if you haven't completed one since 2022 and you're still working for a qualifying employer, that means that you could have two years of employment that just hasn't been certified yet. So make sure that all of your eligible periods that you have gone back and certified employment for them if you were indeed working for a qualifying employer during those eligible periods. Um, also for this borrower, because they're expected to reach 120 in December, when you go to submit your final PSLF application in December, uh, right after you have made that 120 qualifying payment, you may have the option to choose for your loans to be placed into a forbearance while your application is being evaluated. This option is not presented to everyone. Inside of the PSLF help tool, you're going to be asked the question, have you made 120 qualifying payments? For some people, the answer to that question is already um, populated with no, because a cursory glance at your um, loans or your loan disbursement dates would show that your loans haven't been in repayment for long enough uh, for you to reach that 120 payment milestone. But I'm a fan of clicking yes and letting them tell me no. So if you click yes, I have made 120 qualifying payments and it allows you to stay with yes, then you'll have the option of selecting whether you want to continue making payments while your application is evaluated or if you would like for the loans to be placed in a forbearance. So um, if you have the option for the forbearance, you know, that's up to you to choose. The recommendation that comes up within the system, though, is for you to continue to make payments while your application is being evaluated. And if it's found that you have gone over 120 qualifying payments, then you would get a refund for the payments um, that you made beyond the 120 as long as the loans were direct when you um, made that 120th payment. All right, next question. Is a processing forbearance and an administrative forbearance the same? If they go back and say incorrectly that I'm at less than 120, can I get PSLF credit for months that were spent in a processing forbearance? This is a great question and it's a common question because we've heard from a lot of borrowers who have had their loans placed into either an administrative or processing forbearance. And from what we've seen as of late when it comes to PSLF, when your loan is placed into one of those forbearances, that usually means that a discharge is coming. Um, they're just taking some time, not requiring you to make payments while they work out that discharge. So a bit of background on this particular borrower. Their loans were placed into an administrative forbearance after they reached 120 qualifying payments. They wanted to make it known that they did not request this forbearance. And on the last page of the notification about the forbearance, it says that a processing forbearance was approved. The end date for that forbearance was originally set for April of 2024. Now it has been extended until June. Um, this is also something that we've seen among several borrowers. I can think of another borrower in particular who um, just found out actually by logging on to mohila.com and checking the online message portal. Uh, they had a letter that said, the letter was dated in early March and it said that the loans were going to be entering a forbearance at the end of February and that the forbearance would last till the end of April. But then they received another letter, very similar letter dated just a few days later that said the forbearance was now moving to start at the end of April and would end at the end of June. So um, a lot of shifting going on, but it's important to note that during these forbearances, you're not required to make 
any payments. And these are also coming from people who have qualifying payment counts that exceed 120. The borrower that, that I just mentioned has a qualifying payment count of 192. So they have met the requirements for PSLF, but the approval has not been granted yet and the loans have not been discharged. So again, for this borrower, you're not alone, that's happening. But the good thing is, it's usually um, the precursor to the discharge, meaning the debt is about to go away. In terms of whether the time spent in administrative forbearance can count toward PSLF, uh, from what we've seen, uh, the federal Office of Federal Student Aid has directed Mohila to grant these forbearances as well as count the time spent during these forbearances toward both public service loan forgiveness and IDR forgiveness. For people who are pursuing PSLF, when their accounts are placed into these forbearances, it's usually after they have exceeded the 120 uh, qualifying payment count. So it's not um, that time and forbearance wouldn't disqualify you from PSLF. You've already exceeded the program requirements of having 120 qualifying payments. But I totally understand uh, people are um, sometimes just a little fearful, especially in the home stretch, because so many things have gone on you know, throughout the entire 120 month or more process that um, they just question everything. So I totally understand where this question is coming from. The good news is during the forbearances, you're not required to make payments. Your qualifying payment count is already more than 120. So you just have to wait for the discharge to become uh, official. I will say that I'm not sure about timing on this. Usually the people that we've seen placed in these forbearances get the notice that their loans have been forgiven before the forbearance ends. However, we are coming up on a pause and I think that's going to be addressed in the next question, but we're coming up on a processing pause uh, where the Department of Education is going to stop processing PSLF applications for a few months. And this will definitely affect you know, how long it takes people to get their PSLF applications approved. All right, next question is also about PSLF. It's what does this mean? My eligible payments say 184 and my qualifying payments say 131. Am I good or no? Well, I'm happy to share for this bar where you are good. You are good indeed. And I want to congratulate you in advance and thank you for your public service. I'm so glad that PSLF is finally working for you. Um, I suspect that if you have not received it yet, you will receive one of those notices about your loans being placed into an administrative or processing forbearance because your qualifying payment count of 131 is more than the 120 months required to gain approval for PSLF. So I do want to take a quick moment to explain the difference between eligible payments and qualifying payments. Eligible payments are months that can count toward the 120 payment threshold for PSLF after you certify your employment. So in this borrower situation, they had 184 eligible payments. I like to think of eligible payments um, kind of like we're playing spades, you know, that it's your possibles. So you have 184 possible periods that could possibly qualify for PSLF the payments convert to a qualifying payment once you have verified your employment. So qualifying payments are months that do count toward the 120 payment threshold for PSLF because you have already certified your employment. So eligible, again, that's your possible. For this person, they had a possibility of 184 qualifying payments, but a possible only converts to a qualifying once the employment has been confirmed. And for this borrower, they've already made that leap. They have qualifying payments of 131 and are on their way to approval for public service loan forgiveness. Good point to say. Um, I highly recommend going to mohila.com for those of you all who have already applied for PSLF and downloading your payment history and taking screenshots of your payment counts. And this question, next question will explain why. The question is, how will the May through July processing pause affect those who are currently seeking public service loan forgiveness? So from what we know, uh, the Office of Federal Student Aid in the Department of Education is going to transition the processing of both a public service loan forgiveness and the TEACH grant program 
from Mohila to the department. Um, there's been some other talk about this, but basically the end user experience for those of you who are pursuing PSLF is going to look different. It's going to look as though you were dealing directly with the Department of Education. The back end work is still going to be managed by servicers, including Mohila, but from the borrower's perspective, you're going to see more housed with the Department of Education when it comes to PSLF. And to make that transition um, right now from exclusively Mohila to this um, Department of Education led experience, there's going to be a pause. So during the pause, new PSLF applications are not going to be reviewed and that pause is expected to last May, June and July. You can still submit new PSLF applications, but they will not be reviewed. And since they're not going to be reviewed, that means that you will not receive um, payment counts. If you're already on track for PSLF and you submit a form between May and July, you will not see your payment counts rise because your employment is not going to be reviewed because of the pause. So it's important to note that number one, PSLF is not going away. This is not the end of the program. This is a temporary pause in the processing of PSLF applications. So again, payment counts will not be updated. Your employment certifications will not be reviewed until after the pause is over. You can continue to submit those forms. It's just gonna take you longer to receive an answer. And for those of you who have submitted documents, um, you know, going the manual route, you are probably waiting three or four months for an answer anyway. <laughs> but those of you who are used to the electronic signature format, the processing moves much faster, but all of that will be included in the pause. So in May, June, and July, we're not gonna see any updates or changes made to payment counts. So I strongly encourage you to go to mohila.com, download your repayment history if possible, and take screenshots of your payment counts. I'm not saying this to say that I believe they're going to lose everything. It's just that sometimes these transitions, um, from an end user's perspective, it can appear that your records are lost. And that's a very frightening thing. So for your own, um, you know, just preparing for the transition for your own record keeping purposes. I encourage you go to mohila.com, download that payment history, take screenshots of your payment counts. Within the payment count, if you wanna show payment summary and click all of those pages um, that show you the month by month activity, if you wanna do that, if it would make you feel better, I strongly encourage you to do that so that you'll have your records on hand um, while this transition is taking place. Um, you are being instructed, though, to continue making payments unless you have been notified that your loans have been placed in a forbearance. And keep in mind, you can get a refund for any payments that you make over the 120 qualifying payments. So if your loans are already direct, you're already on track for PSLF and you're crossing that 120 line during the pause, keep on making your payments because remember, they're not reviewing forms. They're not going to update your qualifying payment count. Keep on making your payments until you've been notified that your loans are placed in a forbearance. And once the pause is over, when you submit that final PSLF application to update your employment, if you've gone over 120, you will get a refund of the payments that you made above and beyond 120, as long as the loans were already direct at the point that you made those payments, which they should be for everyone who's already on this PSLF journey. There's an official announcement um, on Federal Student Aid's website and we will definitely make sure that uh, we include that link in the chat um, and the comments on YouTube. All right, that does it for the questions. So I do wanna share a state specific resource before we wrap this episode up. And that is the State of Maryland Student Loan Ombudsman. The Student Loan Ombudsman for the State of Maryland is housed within the State's Department of Labor. And the Student Loan Ombudsman is there to help borrowers who are experiencing problems with their servicers. Before you reach out to the Ombudsman, I highly recommend that you try to resolve the issue with your servicer. But after, if after a good faith effort you're getting nowhere, I do encourage you to advocate for yourself. Loop in third parties such as the Student Loan Ombudsman for the state or the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Or if you're out of state um, and your state has an ombudsman, I'd encourage you to reach out to them as well. 
In the state of Maryland, the student loan ombudsman can assist with issues that include failure by the servicer to communicate with a borrower, errors in crediting principal and interest payments, misapplied payments, inaccurate interest rate calculations, billing errors, loan consolidations or modifications errors, and or inappropriate collection activity or tactics. So that's a long list of issues that the Student Loan Ombudsman's Office can assist you with. And if you have not you know, gained any traction toward resolution by dealing directly with your servicer, I strongly encourage you, if you're a Marylander, to access this resource. All right, so I do not see any additional questions at this time. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up this episode of Office Hours. I do want to thank you so much for joining us and for your continued engagement. I just looked at our subscribers. We cracked 100. <laughs> We're now at 101. And that means a lot to us to have a community that's engaged, that's asking questions, that's sharing the information with others. We really hope that you find the information useful. We also encourage you to stay in touch with the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness by visiting us online at mccfw.org. If you'd like to support um, by attending a program or even making a donation, please visit mccfw.org slash support. And I'll be sure to drop that link in the comments in the chat. We are on social media across um, most channels. We are at the MCCFW on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and X, the platform formerly known as Twitter. I'm going to check the comments one last time and I don't see anything there. So uh, thank you again for joining me for this, the April 24th, 2024 edition of Office Hours presented by the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness. If you have questions that come up after this episode is over, please do leave a comment. Um, we're always checking for those so that we can make sure we respond with answers. And you can also look for this episode on YouTube. It will be updated and annotated so you can go straight to the content that you're most interested in. All right. Um, six more days to that IDR deadline. So please go to studentaid.gov and take a look at your loan types. If you have any commercially held loans and you want them to be included within the IDR adjustment, you need to complete the application to consolidate online at studentaid.gov by April the 30th. That's um, as of right now, that's six days away. But please go to studentaid.gov. The application to consolidate is there. You can view your loans by looking at the details through the dashboard and again, taking a look at those servicers. If you see Department of Ed in front of your servicer's name, then you're good to go. If you see just the name of a bank, that means that you have commercially held federal student loans. And to get them included in the IDR adjustment, you want to complete that consolidation application online only at studentaid.gov by April the 30th. All right. I think I have um, said that enough for one episode. <laughs> I thank you again for joining me. And again, I'm Dr. Tisa Silver Kennedy, founder and executive director of the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness. Take care and until next time, be well. Bye-bye.